Before we get started in detail and look at the different aspects of musculoskeletal infections, I want to show you cases. The first case I want to show you is this of a 12-year-old girl who has pelvic pain. And as you can nicely see on these uh, CT images, there's a focal lesion in the right ilium. There's periosteal bone formation. There's a mixed osteoblastic uh, lytic lesion located at the ilium in close proximity to the SI joint. Case number two is a 55-year-old man with chronic back pain. And you see this lesion located in the vertebral bodies in the thoracic spine. It's covering several vertebral bodies, and it has a relatively large soft tissue mass located anteriorly. So keep in mind, these findings could be both infections or the differential diagnosis of infection. Case number three, we have a 35-year-old woman with acute knee pain, and she has a history of Hodgkin's disease. And at the patella and the patella tendon, you see um, a lesion which is causing some erosion of the bone. This looks a little bit like a sinus tract even. And you have this extensive swelling of the patella tendon, a lot of bright material in these tattooed images. Case number four. 40-year-old man with acute low back pain for a couple of days. It's getting increasingly worse. And when you look closely, you see in these MR images that there is an enhancing lesion located in the psoas muscle, the iliacus muscle, the iliopsoas muscle. And please have a closer look. You see these dark areas, dark spots, uh, which are also shown not only on the T2-weighted images, but also on the T1-weighted images. So there are dark material is in, these, uh, in this lesion. And finally, case number five, 25-year-old male with chronic pain and swelling for a long time, for a couple of weeks, month. And what you see on these radiographs of the thump, that there is periosteal bone formation along the proximal phalanx. And you also see that there is sclerosis within the uh, phalanx and the proximal phalanx. It doesn't look very aggressive, it looks relatively chronic. Let's get started. So my talk is going to be structured into five parts. I'm first going to talk about the definitions and types of musculoskeletal infection, then about the roots of spread, about complications, about special infections, which include chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, tuberculosis, and syphilis as well as fungal infection, rubella, and soft tissue infections. And finally, which is really very important, it's imp that we go over some of the important and pertinent differential diagnosis of infections. OK, let's get started. So acute pyogenic osteomyelitis is most frequently really um, acquired in a hematogenous fashion. It's coming from a distant focus. And the organisms that cause pyogenic osteomyelitis are most frequently Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes and Haemophilus influenza. And then we have a couple of crumb negative organisms. Salmonella infections are typical for sickle cell anemia, but you may also find in sickle cell, you may also find um, a, a Staphylococcus aureus. Keep in mind that these infections are typically found at the metaphysis of the long bones. OK, radiographs are very good at um, showing you um, bony changes. However, they are not very good at the early stages of osteomyelitis. And especially if you have the first 40, 24 to 48 hours, you don't really see a lot. You only see soft tissue swelling. So within the early phase of osteomyelitis, you only see really soft tissue swelling, and you see loss of the fat planes, and occasionally you see um, air, which is shown on the, at the right, um, at the, on the right image where you see it right close to the MTP5 joint. Then after seven to 10 days, you see intramedullary destruction, which may be already shown on radiographs. After two to four weeks, you see cortical destruction finally and osteal scalping, periosteal reaction. And after six to eight weeks, finally, you see a sequestrum or involucrum. Now, of course, we all know that MRI is more, much more sensitive compared to, and MR is really most sensitive. So if your MR is really negative in the early phase, uh, so you can be pretty certain that there is no infection. All right, so I want to show you some images where you see side-by-side -side MRI and radiographs. 
and these should be coming. So this is a radiograph that was obtained on December 5. And now please have a look at the MR images which were obtained even earlier. At that stage in this young patient, you don't really see anything. So these are the MR images that were obtained actually earlier. And what you can nicely see in these images is that there is um, already a, a joint effusion, which you see in the suprapatellar recess. But please also note that there is subperiostal fluid, a subperiostal abscess fluid collection. And, um, this is, um, and at that time, you also have abnormalities, abnormalities within the bone marrow already close to the, uh, close to the growth blade. So it's very close to the growth blade. So this is how it looked like a couple of days later. Okay, here we go. This is December 10. And on December 10, what we are seeing is that there's extensively more signal abnormality or enhancing tissue within the bone marrow. You see that it's very close to the growth blade. There's, again, subperiostal abscess formation. And really, at that time, the radiographs are really negative. And then when you go back to the, um, when you go back to the radiographs, uh, which were obtained six weeks later, then you actually finally you see changes within the periosteum. You see changes within the periosteum, periosteal bone formation, and again it looks a little bit calcified. This is already more showing you a subacute phase. So this is not an acute phase anymore. This is subacute. At that time, the patient was already treated. And also, please note in this patient that we have a, a pathologic fracture, which you see nicely in the diaphysis. This is showing you different types of periosteal bone formation, periosteal reaction. On the far left side, you have a patient that has a very aggressive type of infection with Staphylococcus aureus, and you can nicely appreciate these uh, destructions and this Cotman angle-like formation, and you may think of a tumor when you see these images, but this is actually just very aggressive infection. This we've looked at before, this is more a subacute type of um, periostitis, uh, osteomyelitis. And finally, on the right side, you have a patient that has a chronic type of osteomyelitis where you see solid periosteal bone formation, pretty substantial uh, sclerosis, uh, very well-defined borders, and this clearly is chronic. This is not acute. And then we talked about sequestrum and involucrum. And in sequestrum, you really have a necrotic area of bone which is isolated by granulation tissue. And it can persist, it can resorb or extrude through its sinus tract. That's what you can see. And they can be multiple, too. Again, this is a radiograph showing you nicely this focal sequestrum located in the tibial diaphysis. However, MR and CT will show that also very well. So what's an involucrum? Well, an involucrum is reactive new bone formation around which is produced beneath an elevated periosteum. And this is due to infection, and you can nicely see this involucrum here, which is encircling the bone. And it's more common in younger patients because they have a lot of osteoblastic potential. They have more a reactive bone formation or calcification, callus formation, according to inflammatory um, uh, uh, causes. This is showing you a radiograph where you see that involucrum encircling the radius diaphysis. Prodis abscess is a type of subacute osteomyelitis. You see geographic lesions, which is nicely shown in this image on the lateral radiograph in the distal tibia and in the CT where you have this focal lytic lesion. They're usually geographic and they may contain a sequestrum typically found in the metaphysis they may be cortical or medullary. And again, you may have a sinus tract uh, and um, tissue ex um, material extruding from this. Um, also keep in mind that it's not infrequent that these prodis abscesses may actually cross the growth plate, which is otherwise relatively rare, but the subacute form of infection can do this. Sclerosing osteomyelitis or osteomyelitis of Gouray is a subacute form of osteomyelitis. Again, it has these extensive sclerotic changes. This is located in the diaphysis of the femur, and these can sometimes look like metastases or even like lymphoma. So that's an important differential diagnosis in sclerosing osteomyelitis. This case you've seen, this was case number one, and this was a patient who actually had chronic osteomyelitis. So she had the pain for a couple of weeks, 
And now here we see this lytic sclerotic area uh, located in the ilium, and there's solid periosteal bone formation and deformity. These chronic osteomyelitis um, infections can, re uh, can reactivate, and if you see lytic or pleury, pleury borders of or margins of this lesion, then you should consider that there's something new going on. It could be reactivated if there's new periosteal bone formation. Septic arthritis is usually mono, monoarticular, uh, different from uh, the uh, arthritis inflammatory arthropathies Dr. Steinbach described. You may have uh, a joint effusion um, in the first and the early phase, very typical, and this is shown in the hip uh, due to a teardrop distance change of an uh, asymmetry of more than one millimeter, which you can nicely see in this image, where there's a difference of, one, of more than one millimeter from the right to the left side, so joint diffusion on the right side, typically accompanying soft tissue swelling. And finally, in the later stages, stages of septic arthritis, you'll find uh, osteopenia, periarticular osteopenia, uniform joint space narrowing, and erosions, which is the last stage. Again, MRI is really very sensitive for this, and you see joint effusions, uh, which you see nicely in these stir images, or here in the T1-weighted gadolinium enhanced images, see a lot of synovial enhancement, and you see typically uniform narrowing of the joint space. Typically also found are erosions, which you see here in these images, and bone marrow edema, in the stir images, but keep in mind that they also, bone marrow edema pattern will also enhance in T1-weighted gadolinium-enhanced images. Now, let's move to the spine. So, in the early stage of pyogenic osteomyelitis of the spine, you see irregularities of the end plate. That's due to the infection usually having a, a focus beneath the end plate. So, you have hematogenous spread, and then you have this focus of infection, and as the infection as the infection is getting worse, it's eroding the end plate. This is what you see here. It's eroding the end plate. And finally, after some time, you have complete destruction of the end plate, of the disc space, very irregular borders. You may have at later stages disc space narrowing, paraspinal masses, vertebral collapse, and finally fusion. Now, MR is a very good test and shows you very early on whether there's infection or not, and a typical finding associated with osteomyelitis on the MR images, if you see a fluid collection, if you see on the T2-weighted images a fluid collection in the disc space, it's usually very typical for osteomyelitis, and usually you have at the same time not only the fluid collection, but erosions of the end plate, so that's a very typical finding. So once you see an eroded end plate as well as fluid collection, so you should think in terms of osteomyelitis. And this is the second example where you see the fluid collection, the destruction here, fluid around it, and edema, bone marrow edema pattern within the uh, S1. Sickle cell hemoglobinopathy has um, typically infections with salmonella, which are otherwise relatively rare. But keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily have to be salmonella. It could also be staphylococcus, which is pretty common in these patients too. Usually, these infections are located in the diaphysis, and um, they are typically found in areas where you have infarction. This is an example of a patient with sickle cell um, disease, and you see that there's extensive infarction located within the humeral head, and sometimes it can be very difficult to, difficult, uh, to differentiate infection from infarction. Even if there's adjacent synovitis, that can also occasionally be found with um, bone infarction. However, if you see a ton, very extensive synovitis around it, you should always consider that there's infection underlying it. Now, another hot topic is diabetic foot, in foot infection. We've heard a lot about neopathic osteoarthropathy by Dr. Steinbach, um, and MRI helps you in differentiating whether you just have neopathic osteoarthropathy or whether you have actually infection. Uh, MRI demonstrates the extent of the infection, and if you see normal marrow, really, on, uh, on MR images, then it's very unlikely that you have infection. Uh, keep in mind, however, if you have abnormal marrow, that doesn't really help you a lot because neopathic foot can occasionally look like infection. You may have insufficiency fractures which have, which have bone marrow edema pattern, and you may also occasionally see 
reactive edema from cellulitis, which is not infrequently found in these patients, even without osteomyelitis. This is an example where you have a patient MRI of the foot, T2-rated images, gadolinium enhanced fat-saturated images, and this has the typical signs of infection. And this is something you have to look for. So if you find a sinus tract, or if you find replacement of the soft tissue fat, which you see here very extensively, the whole soft tissue fat is really abnormal. This is a fat-saturated image. This should be all dark in signal, and this is enhancing quite substantially. So you have also extensive fluid collections here, which is not typically found only with neuropathic osteoarthropathy. This is a typical finding for infection. So this is what helps you look for the soft tissues, look for the subcutaneous fat, look whether there are large fluid collections, and whether there's extensive bone marrow abnormality, which we see here. Okay, let's talk about roots of spread, okay? Osteomyelitis, you may get it directly through bites or bullets, as shown here. Puncture wounds may cause it, surgery can do it. And then you have contiguous infections from lesions which are in the neighborhood, and they are spreading from soft tissue to the bone, which you see here, um, where there is a subperiosteal abscess which is spreading into the bone, or bursitis in a patient with hallux valgus that's spreading into uh, the uh, first metatarsal. Typically, however, uh, osteomyelitis may be due to hematogenous infection. Again, as the site and the um, distribution of the infection may vary to age, and these diagrams you've probably seen before. If you have a really young child, uh, less than one year of age, usually the um, epiphysis is not uh, can be involved because there's not really a growth plate any, uh, not yet. However, if you have a child that is about one to 16 years of age, you have a nice, uh, nice growth plate, and this growth plate really serves as a barrier, and usually the infection only extends to the growth plate and stays within the metaphysis and the diaphysis. However, keep in mind that occasionally the infection may break out of the bone, it may infect the joint space, and then you may have septic arthritis. This is an older patient, adults, or patients older than 16 where the growth plate is really f uh, fused. That's again where the infection can uh, go all the way into the epiphysis uh, from the originating from the metaphysis into the epiphysis. Complications you may find with osteomyelitis include if there's joint involvement, it can include leg length discrepancy, what you see in this image. See how this right leg is completely shorter due to this infection of the right hip joint with substantial deformity. Other complications you may have are slipped epiphyses, as seen here in that patient that had extensive osteomyelitis of the humerus involving the metaphysis and the diaphysis. Finally, you may find avascular necrosis, such as shown here, where you have um, extensive osteomyelitis, which is basically blocking the perfusion and is causing uh, necrosis of the femoral head. And finally, you may, since the bone is weakened, you may find pathologic fractures. If you have, if patients have osteomyelitis for a really long time, for several years, what you may see is that there may be proliferation of bone, proliferation of soft tissues, and finally destruction of the bone and relatively extensive findings, and they may be a sign of uh, malignant transformation. You may see uh, uh, tra transformation into squamous cell carcinoma, so that's something important to look at. So finally, we want to look at the uh, typical at these special infections, and the first one we want to look at is chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. This is a subacute chronic osteomyelitis. It's not really clear where it comes from. You cannot isolate organisms in these patients, and it's not really clear where it comes from. So it involves multiple bones, typically the lower extremities, metaphyses, tubular bones, and very, very typical is it involves the medial end of the clavicles in pediatric patients. And then you may see osteolytic changes with intense sclerosis occasionally, and it does not respond to antibiotic therapy. So keep in mind that um, the, the term SAFO is also used for chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, and this stands for synovitis, acne, pustulosis, hyperostosis, and osteitis. Uh, so this is something which is uh, going along with skin changes and osteo, and these 
these osteomyelitis typical changes within the bone. And this may be typically also found at the medial ends of the clavicles. Differential diagnosis for chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis is fibrous dysplasia and Paget's disease. This is an example showing you these typical very sclerotic areas located in the distal radius with lytic changes as well, but very typical, the sclerotic changes, but not only located in the, um, not only located in the radius, but also located in the tibia and in the calcaneus. Tuberculosis is a very special infection. It is involving the skeletal system in one to three percent, and usually it comes from hematogenous spread, mostly from the lung, but also from the genital urinary tract. It may take a really long time before you see it on the radiographs, and we are going to discuss that in a little while. So it really takes a long time for it to be seen. You may find cold abscesses, and sequestra are relatively uncommon. Now, spinal tuberculosis is most frequently found, and um, actually 50% of the skeletal TB cases are found at the spine, and it starts typically anteriorly at the end plate, which you see here, and then it uh, causes end plate erosion, and then finally it moves along, it moves along the anterior part, along the anterior longitudinal ligament, and it can cause scalloping, um, at the anterior part of the vertebral body, which is very typical. So it begins here and then slowly it moves down, and this is also why it affects frequently several levels. This is an example where you see TB infection causing, affecting several levels. So you see it's uh, affecting three levels of the um, thoracolumbar spine, and you see a destruction. It may have an epidural extension, and the vertebral destruction, however, is relatively late. And the reason, and I already mentioned that before, uh, TB is not very aggressive because it doesn't produce osteolytic enzymes or proteolytic enzymes. So these enzymes it produces are not very aggressive. They're not destroying the bone really, and that is why it takes so long for that disease to uh, basically take its course. And it's, again, it's not very destructive. This is a case of TB dactylitis, usually found more in younger people. It's uh, typically can be multiple focal, it goes along with soft tissue swelling, periostitis, bone involvement, and may cause fractures. And um, this is one of these cases I showed this. This was case number five. This is TB dactylitis. Differential diagnosis includes, again, we talked about this before, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, sickle cell, and other infections, of course. Syphilis is caused by treponema pallidum. It may be congenital or acquired. And it has typically the Wimberger sign. And Wimberger sign refers to symmetric lesions which are located at the proximal tibia. Don't mix that up with Wimberger ring sign. The Wimberger ring sign is found with scurvy. So this is going to be shown to you later by Dr. Boutin. He's going to talk about Wimberger ring sign. But the Wimberger sign is found with syphilis. You may not only find this typical Wimberger sign at the medial metaphyses of the proximal tibia, you may also find periostitis, which is very typically found with syphilis, which you see here. Sabershin deformity you find at later stages, and gamma are sterile bone abscesses found with uh, tertiary, tertiary syphilis. Fungal infection is also something which is relatively non-aggressive. It's very relatively slow. Coccidium mycosis is something we see pretty frequently here in this part of the US, in the southwestern part. You may find punched out lytic lesion, abscesses, other fungal infections you should be familiar with or you should know as blastomycosis, cryptococcosis, actinomycosis, and maduromycosis. This is an example which I showed you. This was case number three. This was that patient that had Hodgkin's disease and she acquired this infection, and it turned out to be coccidiomycosis, and she was immunosuppressed, so that may be one of the reasons why she had this really bad infection with coccidiomycosis. This is a case of blastomycosis. Again, keep in mind, fungal infection is not very aggressive. It can look like a tumor, which you see in the distal fibula. And finally, you have uh, this case of actinomycosis. Again, destruction of the, of the discs. But again, it doesn't have a very aggressive pattern, not much fluid surrounding it. All right, rubella is transmitted from the mother to the fetus in the first trimester. Um, you have typically uh, medial metaphyseal beaking, which is found 
at, typically at the knee region, and you may find uh, these um, findings which are called celery stalking. And this is what you see here, the celery stalking. However, keep in mind that it's also found with toxoplasmosis and cytomegaly virus infection. Um, soft tissue infection, you may see as cellulitis, abscesses, pyomyositis. This is a case of necroticizing fasciitis where you see very extensive uh, soft tissue edema around the fascia. Keep in mind that necroticizing fasciitis is a very aggressive disease. It moves on very, very quickly, and uh, sometimes we don't even see the, see the disease because it's so aggressive, and the patients may end up with amputation or very early may die even. Pyomyositis is typically found in immunosuppressed patients. They can have abscesses. A differential diagnosis includes trauma, strain, and contusion. You may occasionally see also myositis ossificans, which are all differential diagnosis. Keep in mind, trauma can also occur first, and then this area of trauma contusion can be infected. This is case number four. This is a patient that had these extensive soft tissue abnormalities located at the iliosaurus muscle. Uh, you have little air collections in here, which really tell you that this is infection which are better seen on the CT three days later when there was a drainage performed. And this was a patient with sickle cell anemia and um, abscess formation, and this was due to salmonella. So finally, let's have a look in the last couple of minutes at the differential diagnosis, which you should keep in mind. And these include tumor, and this is one of the cases. This looks really like TB osteomyelitis, and that's what we thought in the beginning that it would be. However, it has a very big soft tissue component which is actually enhancing, and this is not very typical for TB. This is more frequently found uh, with um, tumorous infiltration, and this patient actually had lymphoma. And lymphoma is actually a very interesting tumor because it can leave the cortex intact, that's what you see here, and it still can permeate through the cortex and cause extensive um, soft tissue um, lesions, which we see here. And again, if you see these big soft tissue lesions, they're not very typical for TB osteomyelitis. And then, of course, you have other tumors that can look like infection, including osteodosteoma, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, metastases, and lymphoma. This was an example of osteodosteoma. Also, again, we talked about trauma before. Myositis ossificans sometimes can look like an, like an infection, and this is an example where you see this extensive infection located between the femur and the ischium, and there's a fo focal traumatized area and, uh, which is enhancing also. That can be difficult, so again, include this in your differential. So finally, I would like to give you some take-home points. So infection can really mimic arthritis. It can also look like tumors, and it can look like trauma occasionally. The history doesn't really always help you because trauma can lead to infection and fevers can be seen in patients with tumor, and then some infections do not present with a fever. So keep that in mind. It can be very tricky. And keep also in mind that pyogenic bacterial infections may look different and may behave differently from chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis.